Hello. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular Wednesday series of the distinguished uh, seminar speakers for the electrical engineering and computer science. We are still together. <laughs> who, knows, who knows how long, but we are still together. It is my pleasure to introduce you, I need my glasses, um, Daniel Lee, who is a um, UPS Foundation Chair Professor in the School of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his bachelor's degree summa cum laude in physics, remember? Uh, from Harvard University and his PhD in condensed matter physics from uh, MIT in 95. Before coming to Penn, he was a researcher at AT&T and Lucent Bell Laboratories in theoretical physics and biological computation departments. He's a fellow of IEEE uh, of AAAI has received the National Science Foundation Career Award and University of Pennsylvania Lindbeck Teaching Award for distinguished teaching. He was also a fellow of the Hebrew University Institute for Advanced Studies in Jerusalem and affiliate of the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology and organized the U.S.-Japan National Academy of Engineering Frontiers of Engineering Symposium. He is the director of the Grass Club, which I started many years ago. You don't want to know how many. But um, I will tell you folks that since I left, the, the, the Grass Club is much, much bigger and much, much better. So it's my real pleasure to welcome Daniel Lee. Can everyone hear me okay if I speak like this? Okay. Um, yeah. To be here, and thank you, Rujina. We're indebted to Rujina for starting the GRASP lab at Penn. Um, what I really love about GRASP is that kind of it has Rujina's spirit in terms of combining um, folks, students, and faculty from various disciplines, from electrical engineering, from computer science, from mechanical engineering, thinking about ro robotics as kind of a very holistic type of science and trying to understand basic principles as well as kind of building systems. So what I wanted to do today was tell you about some work from the GRASP lab. Some from my, uh, I just want to acknowledge some of my students, Steve McGill, Sung Jun Yi, and Paul Vernaza, um, on more on the systems aspects of robotics as motivation. And then I wanted to explain some more recent theoretical work. Um, and this is in collaboration with some of my colleagues at Harvard, Suyun uh, Chung, who's a student, PhD student with Haim Sampolinsky, who's between Harvard and Hebrew University. So what I want to do today is um, tell you a little about, uh, think about what we mean by kind of man versus machine intelligence. And then I want to introduce the concept of low dimensional representations to help in decision making. And then um, what I want to get to is then from the theoretical side, thinking about the role of invariances and manifolds in terms of these low dimensional representations. And then I wanted to connect with some kind of recent work. Um, there's a lot of excitement in neural networks. So can we use these kinds of mathematical concepts to understand what's happening in terms of what we're doing with these kind of deep neural networks? And then I'm going to introduce kind of a, a, a physics-based theory, a statistical mechanical theory of these kind of capacity of these neural networks. And then I can try to point out some applications and potential future directions in this area. Okay. So when we talk about uh, kind of artificial intelligence versus natural intelligence, what we mean by kind of what we can compute with the brain versus what we can do on machines, I think there's been a lot of excitement in recent, uh, uh, you know, these recent years just because of, and I know here at Berkeley there's kind of, uh, you know, ideas of, well, whether machine intelligence in some, pa in some cases are surpassing human intelligence and whether we can try to understand kind of where this field will go in terms of what humans will be able to do in the future versus what will have machines replace humans. So this is, I think, a very ripe area. Um, as an example of kind of some of the types of issues that come up, one of the types of projects that we've worked on at Penn is I've led a team that did this autonomous driving. So this is a picture of our car, you know, back in 2007, so nine years ago. 
Um, this is, you know, a basically a Toyota Prius at the time with a bunch of sensors, a bunch of actuators, and, you know, now the idea was can you build the intelligence that can connect the sensing to the proper actuation so that it can drive in kind of, you know, say urban environments, right? So when we do this type of uh, uh, build of such a uh, machine, the way we did this for the, um, you know, at that time, nine years ago, was we had to think kind of a lot of in terms of the human engineering of how we break down this kind of complex problem of driving into its various kind of sensing modalities, the actuation, the path planning, the decision making. And so what we have is kind of a bunch of modules when we build this machine into kind of high level planners, you know, state machines for behaviors, thinking about how to connect on the kind of on the um, on the low, uh, low level side of the sensors to object segmentation, localization, state estimation, you know, mapping, how that ties into navigation, and then how we can then pull that down to the motors where you have trajectory following, motor controllers, local kinds of planners, until you get to the actuator level. So that's kind of how you, you know, you know, and I don't think that the folks, you know, at Tesla or, you know, uh, Google, basically they're using the same type of software architecture when they're doing this kind of autonomous driving. So this is the type of thing that if you do this properly, right, if you build a system that layers the sensing and the actuation, thinking about the relevant time scales, you can do these kinds of uh, effects, right? So this is during the, the competition. This is our car. It's completely autonomous. It's sensing, you know, the vehicle in front of it. It's then able to queue up behind the vehicle. This is a human-driven car. The human-driven car is going through this four-way intersection. So then um, basically it's looking using vision on the line on the road. It's then able to stop. This is a four-way intersection. It's been mapped, kind of given GPS coordinates, so it knows that it's in the vicinity of a four-way intersection. And now it's going to plan to make a right-hand turn. But if you remember the rules of the road, right, there's basically another car here that was in the intersection first. So our vehicle is waiting for this car to go through the intersection, knowing that it, wasn't, you know, it doesn't have the right of way. But something's wrong with that car. That's another robot car. There's some bugs in their software. It's not going to move. So then the rules of the road said that if you wait 45 seconds, you're allowed to go out of turn. So now we go out of turn. We make a right-hand turn. And now we uh, come face to face. This is actually Cornell's vehicle in the competition. It's going the wrong direction. It's, it's tried to pass this car. So we see you know, this vehicle. We stop. And you can kind of see this human-driven car. These, are, these robots don't know where they're going. He backs up. And there's enough room to kind of cut around the stalled vehicles, around the guy who backed up, and then kind of continue the rest of the course. Right? So this is kind of how you can do it if you think carefully about you know, how do you do state estimation, with your sensing, with the mapping, with the navigation, with the kind of planning, the trajectory following. You can get these kinds of behaviors. And it's amazing how quickly this type of technology has gone from you know, academic research labs to billion dollar industries today, right? It's just how fast this has happened, okay? But now what we would like to try to do, if you come from the machine learning community, you know, how can we you know, avoid putting in all this kind of human knowledge? Is it possible, and this is I think up for debate, is it possible that you could have a, a complex behavior like this learn directly from sensing to actuation, right? Can we kind of build, you know, just some tabula rasa type of say neural network that will take, you know, just direct sensor inputs and figure out the appropriate, you know, outputs on the actuation side without any kind of prior models, and then basically close the loop around the environment as you do in robotics, and you can kind of try to generate a behavior that would do this type of task, you know, from scratch. And I think this is up for debate. And I, I'm, I'm on the side that, you know, there has to be some models. You have to have some knowledge of the physical world. You need to know. You know, it's nice to know that there's 3D in the world. You know, these are the things that are much more difficult for uh, kind of just a learn system to get from scratch, you know, even with millions of examples maybe. Now, of course, this is what folks would like to be able to do. And, of course, there's all this excitement in deep learning that you could maybe, you know, just generate a convolutional deep network, maybe something that approximates Q values inside this network, stick that all together and build this end to end where you can kind of take, you know, driving inputs and try to generate the appropriate kind of driving behaviors in all these situations. So this is up for debate. And uh, what I want to try to do is think about some of the fundamental underlying principles in terms of what are maybe some of the limitations in terms of representations and what we can then do to um, overcome some of these things from this kind of pure data-driven approach. All right? 
Okay, so that's kind of an example from autonomous driving, which I think people have a good idea of what's involved. I also want to tell you a little bit about some other robotic applications, right? So this is an example of our humanoid robot that we built at, at Penn that is doing some more mobile manipulation. This is part of the uh, last year's DARPA Robotics Challenge. And here you see the task is to do something where, you know, you're kind of visualizing a drill, you have to grab the drill, you have to kind of do some uh, uh, arm planning to move the drill, and then you're going to have to walk with this drill over to the wall and then kind of plan out a trajectory to kind of maybe drill out a circle so that you can punch through a wall, right? That was the task here. So that's kind of what we have in terms of being able to do this with a robot today, right? You know, grab, the, you know, figure out some grass poles, try to have an arm that grabs this thing, move it around, and then do this kind of manipulation, okay? This, if you compare current performance of our robots to um, humans, Right, this is where we are very deficient, right? So if people have, are aware of kind of these competitions among kids, which is cup stacking, right? So now you can watch kind of the world's best humans doing this. Right? You can see this is real time, right? So how fast humans are able to do this kind of perception and kind of, this is real time. So you did this in like two seconds, right? This uh, 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 cup manipulation. So that is kind of, you know, we're orders of magnitude away from being able to do that kind of task in this manipulation. So we can see the gap. So, so this kind of idea that, you know, robots will take over human jobs in this area, forget it. Right? You want to see it again? Sure. That is a human manipulation. Okay. <laughs> so... That is on the manipulation side. I also want to tell you a little bit on the uh, nav flight navigation side. So this is in conjunction with uh, this collaboration with Vijay Kumar's lab. This is kind of what we have done. This is an older robot where we've taken um, a quad rotor here, put a LiDAR sensor on it, you know, have some sort of three-dimensional mapping, have the quad rotor automatically lift off. You know, as it, as it, this is now old technology, but you, know, you can see kind of what's possible, right? You, you take your quad rotor, you're now scanning the area with your LiDAR, you're building some sort of 3D voxel map of the environment, and you're now trying to figure out the best pl path plan, and then controlling then the propeller so that you're actually flying this, right? So that's kind of what you can do with a quad rotor today. Now and again, we can compare this to human performance, and a, there's actually a professional league of people that fly quad rotors, right? And this is now using first-person video devices, so basically putting on something like an Oculus Rift, and then controlling a, a, a quad rotor to fly using just the camera input from the quad rotor, and you can see kind of how they do this. Right? This is real time again. So these uh, humans are driving these things through these environments at this speed, flying around these different obstacles, going through the different types of um, uh, regimes. So this is kind of, you know, again, we don't have any autonomous systems that, you know, without pre-mapping, just being able to kind of come into a novel environment and being able to do this kind of flight control at this kind of speed with visual navigation, right? So that is an example of another comparison, all right? Okay, and so um, I showed you a little bit of DARPA Robotics Challenge. Again, kind of sometimes the sorry state of what we have in this field, this is captured in kind of, the, I think, the, the most uh, uh, watched video from the DARPA Robotics Challenge last year was the following. Right, was more the bad things that all the robots did. Right, so this is uh, you know seeing showing you how it hard is to walk. This is CMU's robot when it couldn't open the door properly. This is uh, IHMC's from Florida where it couldn't walk over the rubble pile. This is just another robot that just kind of crashed in the middle of the thing. And this is uh, I think uh, a <laughs> Japanese robot. This is Virginia Tech's robot. You know trying to walk. Um, this is another Japanese robot. It doesn't even grab the doorknob. Uh, this is IHMC's robot, again, falling off the stairs. Um, I think the ne you know, this is a robot from Germany, kind of sidestepping off. Uh, this is a robot from Korea. You can see, you know, almost all teams had a lot of difficulties. This is actually interesting. Look, the robot doesn't even have grasped the, the wheel, and basically by turning the wheel has <laughs> torqued itself over. This is just a system failure on part of the robot. This is our robot, so we're not immune. We fell over too and had the uh, honor of having the drill fall on us. 
This is MIT's robot trying to get out of the car here. You see he has some sort of epileptic spasm here and just fell over, right? So, so you can kind of see that, you know, in this area at least, with interactions with an uncertain dynamic physical world, that we are still kind of very far away from what humans are able to do. All right? Okay, so now what I want to do is talk a little bit on the kind of, um, uh, on the uh, theoretical side of how we can try to overcome some of these limitations of machines. And what I wanted to do first of all was introduce you to the concept of low dimensional representations and what we can do with low dimensional representations for decision making and planning. All right? Okay, so what do we mean by this? When we think about how to, you know, think of a reason about a robot's motions, right, we think about in robotics something called the configuration space of the robot. So for the case of something like this humanoid robot, it would be the configuration space would be basically all the joint angles of this robot. And these many joint angles if you're a humanoid with lots of degrees of freedom, right? Your elbow, you know, multiple joints in your shoulder, your wrist, you know, your torso, your neck. I mean, this is all the different angles. And what you have to then do to control the robot is you have to sequence these angles, many of these angles, in time, right? To, to kind of move a trajectory, move around, you have to have you know, this high dimensional set of angles and you have to kind of control and plan kind of a trajectory on the order of say 10 to 100 times a second. Right? That's what you need to do. So when we want to do some sort of planning, right, what we're trying to do is, for example, I want to reach this bottle of water and I want to do that you know, moving from you know, my arm from here to here. I have to reason about all these different joint angles and how they will move in this kind of high dimensional configuration space so that I don't knock into things and that I will kind of move my arm and my torso so that I can get to a position where I can grasp this bottle, right? And so this is a trajectory in this high dimensional configuration space going from some, say, some initial condition to some final condition to pick up this bottle. And what we want to try to do is figure out how to get kind of the optimal trajectory that gets you from this space to this, this point to this next point. All right. Now, in robotics, the standard algorithm to do this kind of high dimensional planning is based upon sampling. And for instance, it's something called a randomly, rapidly exploring random tree, RRTs. And what you just essentially do is you start with your initial configuration and you generate local moves that move you around in this configuration space. And you basically are trying to sample your configuration space until you can get to kind of the final position. That's the standard algorithm that's being used in robotics today. Now the problem with this is that when you have a high dimensional space, for you to kind of find this trajectory is a very difficult problem. And this is known as the curse of dimensionality, right? That in order for you to do this in a high dimensional space, the number of samples that you need to find this trajectory grows exponentially with the dimensionality of the system. All right? So the problem with this is if you take this standard algorithm, this is a movie showing kind of what you get when you do this RRT. This is, you know, if you know anything, there's something called ROS in robotics, a robotics operating system. It's a standard package to do this kind of arm planning. This is the, uh, one of the packages that tries to generate this sample-based approach. And you can see that this robot, it's a PR, old PR2 robot, it's trying to you know, move its arm between these kind of windows that we created. And this set of high dimensional samples is generating very suboptimal things that a human wouldn't do, right? It's kind of twisting its wrists in funny positions. It's moving its arms around. These are all the issues that you get from doing this, all right? So this is what's the problem with this high dimensional approach of trajectory planning. So what we wanted to do was think about a lower dimensional representation that allows us to do this kind of more efficiently. And the way we approach this problem is not to do this kind of sampling based approach and generating a graph in high dimensions, but think about the actual underlying continuous problem. And this is known um, as, you know, you can write down this optimization problem in terms of what we call a Lagrangian, right? And so what we do is the following. We, we, we think about a trajectory in some high dimensional vector space parameterized by some, you know, uh, uh, parameter S. And we have some cost function, saying that in certain regions of trajectory space, I'm hitting something, it's very high cost. In other regions where I kind of have no obstacles, I can kind of move very efficiently. So that's my cost function. And I'm trying to find a trajectory that basically minimizes this kind of integral, right? Integrated over cost, basically times some local path length. And you have these constraints then that the trajectory needs to start in a certain initial condition and end in a final condition. 
So these are the uh, issues in terms of these uh, uh, Lagrangian formulation. All right. So now how do you solve this? Right? So the way you do this optimization problem is you can think about it as dynamic programming. This is something that you, you know, if you um, know, know about uh, uh, optimization through time, what you do is you take this problem and you write down the Lagrangian and you write down what's known as a value function. Right? This is analogous to writing down Bellman's equation for you know, trying to solve a dynamic program. And in this case, with this kind of continuous time formulation, the value function, right, it's kind of the cost to go, is written in terms of a partial differential equation called the iconal equation. And then the optimal trajectory that you can get is just basically given by taking the gradient of this value function. All right? And so this is the way you can approach this problem. From a dynamic programming point of view, you write down this continuous you know, high dimensional optimization problem. You write down the condition for optimal control, or this uh, iconal equation. Once you find this, you can do this. Now, there's kind of discrete methods to try to find this approximate kind of um, value function. This James Sethian here at Berkeley has worked on kind of ways of doing this kind of efficiently in lower dimensional spaces. And so you can, do, you can solve the problem using this approach. Doesn't this apply to any optimization whatsoever? Don't you always do this for optimization? Uh, you can do gradient descent. Uh, so this is, this is a dynamic like gradient program. Descent. Huh? It, does, it looks kind of like gradient descent. But the idea is that you, you generate this cost to go function, and then the optimal trajectory is basically a local move with this cost to go. So you basically take out the temporal dimension by generating this uh, value function. That's the, that's the trick in dynamic programming. OK? So um, what we can then see is that this has a nice analogy to actually optics. OK? So how does optics work? Right? So in optics, what you have is you have some space. Let's say that you're trying to analyze the motion of light through you know, a bunch of stained glass windows. What you're trying to then say is that at every point in space, you have something called the index of refraction, which is kind of like a local cost. And what you have to then do is tr figure out how the light rays move through these index of refraction media. And the, and the principle by which light operates is actually Fermat's principle of least time in the sense that light rays travel from one point to another point by minimizing this Lagrangian, which looks exactly like what we're using for robot planning. All right? that you have your index of refraction, and the index of refraction is basically controlling the time of, of, of the travel, and the light rays are essentially minimizing the time between points. Okay? So we can, we're making an analogy here between robot planning to actually tracing light rays through refracted media. So now the question is, what do we use to simplify this optics problem? All right? And if, I have kind of, if I'm trying to do optics in high dimensions and I just do light ray tracing, it might be very difficult to do. Now there is a theorem, a mathematical theorem, that, makes us, that allows us to kind of simplify these problems. And this is called Noether's theorem. And what this says is that if your Lagrangian that you're trying to optimize has a continuous symmetry in it, Right, so for instance, if you have translational symmetry or some rotational symmetry or some sort of symmetry in the problem, then the solution right, conserves momentum. And so you can write down then an uh, invariant to your motion which has this conservation law to it. All right, that's, the, that's the general idea, and that Emma Noether is the one that wrote this down as a physical principle. All right, so how do I think about this principle? This is how you learn high school physics, right? When you learn high school physics and someone said, you know, analyze the three-dimensional motion of this thing flying through space, what you then did was said that there are different types of directions of this problem. One direction of the problem does not conserve momentum. That's the Z direction. That is the kind of important direction of motion. But the motion along the X and Y directions conserve momentum, so in some sense, this is not a three-dimensional problem. It's really a one-dimensional problem that you can then lift back into three dimensions. And that's how you solve these physics problems. Right? So when you do this right, with um, optics, right, if I have an index of refraction that has some sort of symmetry to it, let's say translational symmetry, then the conserved law is actually saying that there is a relationship between the index of refraction and the angle of incidence on one side and the, and the index of refraction and the angle of incidence on the other side. This is Snell's law. So Noether's theorem in optics is reflected in being able to write down Snell's law. And what I'm saying here is that we want to think about high dimensional generalizations of Snell's law to analyze these paths in high dimensional space. Okay? 
So we can do this for robot planning, right? Which, as, as, as I said, we have some cost function living in some high dimensional space. If we can find directions of this space where there's something like translational um, symmetry, we can then basically take this high dimensional Lagrangian, write down conserved momentums, solve the problem in a lower dimensional space, lift then the optimal trajectories back into the high dimensional space, and this will be the optimal trajectory in the high dimensional space. Okay? And the way we can then do this is we have an algorithm. This is a, a spectral method, so you can analyze something like the gradient of the cost function. You can write down some sort of eigenvector equation, and then the principal eigenvectors of the spectral method then tell you which directions of your problem are kind of have translational symmetry and which directions don't have translational symmetry. So this is a, a kind of an automatic way of identifying the relevant directions of your problem and kind of the ones that have conserved momentum loss. All right? So we can do this for arm planning. So for instance, I need to plan, say, an arm with many joints in it, and I need to have it go from one side of the problem, you know, say, of this you know, set of obstacles to this other set of obstacles. It's in a high dimensional configuration space because there's many angles in the arm. What we can then do is basically do the spectral procedure. We learn a low dimensional representation of the motion. That is maybe, you know, the first basis here and the second basis here. We then project this high dimensional cost function into a lower dimensional basis. You then solve a low dimensional uh, planning problem. And then you lift the problem back up into the high dimensional space. And this will then be a good plan for the arm. Okay, that's the basic idea and how we can use this kind of low dimensional subspaces to help with planning. And this is what happens when you do this. So this is a high dimensional arm. On the left here is planning using an RRT, the original kind of sub sampling based method. And this is a the plan generating from just two bases. So we're doing this in two dimensions and then lifting the uh, motion back up into the high dimensional space. And you can see the difference, right? So you can see the sampling, and you can see kind of the two-dimensional motion that can, you can generate using this low-dimensional representation. All right? So that's kind of... This is meant to represent iterations in an optimization? This is meant to represent the whole trajectory. So we're finding the optimal trajectory from the initial condition to the final condition on the right, and now they're just replaying the trajectory over and over. Okay, so the idea is that this would be a path through this high-dimensional configuration space, and what we're trying to find is this optimal path. This is the answer from our algorithm on the right. What the RRT gives you is what's shown on the left, right? Because the RRT gets stuck by doing this kind of random sampling of this high dimensional space. Okay? All right, so then we can actually take this and put it back onto a robot arm. This is on the PR2. And this is an implementation of this algorithm, this low dimensional kind of planning algorithm, where you can now see that it's actually able to generate plans much faster between kind of initial conditions and final condition is much smoother and actually much more optimal in terms of you know, overall joint angle space that you're actually traversing. Right? So this is the type of approach that you can have. Yep. How did you ever find the symmetries? I mean, if you have a flat glass surface, you've got a big symmetry there. But in this case, where do you find symmetry? So that's the a machine learning approach to this, is basically taking an analysis of you know, the cost function, looking at the kind of gradients of this cost function, making a n by n matrix out of these cost functions and then uh, these gradients and then looking for print doing a spectral decomposition of this that's that's then how you identify which directions in configuration space have kind of essentially symmetries which directions don't have symmetries okay. is that clear question so if if your system really has a um, has kind of a full symmetry like this this will identify it now, if you don't have a full symmetry, but something that's kind of invariant but not exactly, then this will identify that which is the best directions. And then we have an iterative procedure which then can kind of use that partial symmetry and then still do this kind of uh, optimization. So, so we can actually handle that case as well. And you don't find the symmetries in real time. You, uh, you pre-calculate all that stuff. Yeah, we pre-calculate. We do a kind of this learning analysis before the arm motion. But then you can reuse it for different arm motions. Is that clear? OK, so that is, I wanted to just show you the power of thinking about these kind of lower dimensional representations for decision making. Um, what I want to do now is think about how these types of kind of structures, these geometrical structures in kind of high dimensional spaces impact machine learning in general. And so now I want to change focus now from planning, decision making, 
into something that's more on the perceptual side, how we think about kind of decision making using sensor. All right. So I want to talk now a little bit about how we model invariances as manifolds. Right? And then I'm going to introduce some of the theory behind that. Okay, so now let's talk about perception, right? Um, and for instance, as I said, this kind of, uh, you know, once, before I can actually plan a trajectory to grab something, I'll have to be able to recognize those objects and to be able to reason about their grass poles and things like that. Now, the hard part, one of the most difficult things in, um, in this kind of perception problem is that you have tremendous variability, right? You have lighting changes, you have uh, changes in viewpoint, you have changes in pose, right, that this guy, you know, might be, you know, uh, rotated or could be kind of tilted. You have changes in the background of the scene. So all these invariances is what makes kind of object recognition, segmentation very difficult because you don't have a single kind of example. You have to really think about the whole range of in, uh, uh, possibilities when you have these kinds of changes. Okay? So the way we model this is something called perceptual manifolds where, you know, say I have some input image, like this face image, right? And the way I think about this as a mathematical representation is just say some sort of feature vector in some high dimensional feature space. And this is what represents this particular input image. Now what makes, say, you know, face recognition more difficult is that these invariances come in, right? That, you know, a person's face might not be exactly centered. It might be rotated. It might be shifted to the side. The person might be smiling, might be frowning. And so the way we model this is that a single image is a single point in this high dimensional feature space, but a person, an object, is actually a whole set of these points that's kind of continuously varying according to these kind of underlying parameters. And so this generates a low dimensional manifold in this high dimensional feature space. And so to distinguish, say, one person from another person, you really have to separate not points from each other, but these manifolds from each other. And that's really the key in terms of being able to do this kind of task. All right? Now, this is, seen, this is also thought about in the brain. right? So this is Jim DiCarlo's work at MIT. They're looking at kind of the progression of visual representations through the brain. So starting from V1, V2, going to V4, going to inferior temporal cortex. And what they're saying is that the invariances inherent in vision are reflected in the representations at these different layers of the brain. And there's an idea that these kinds of manifolds that represent these invariances are being reformatted in the brain as the signal is progressing through your brain. And the question is, what is this kind of reforming? What's a good reformatting of these signals? And that's, I think, a key issue in terms of thinking about both on the biological side, how we represent information, as well as maybe on the machine learning side of what we want these representations to be. Okay? So, uh, and now there's ways of actually doing, kind of actually modeling these manifolds. So there's a whole history in machine learning of manifold learning. Um, this started with my good friends, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Saul Roweiss and uh, Killian Weinberger, as well as some folks at uh, Facebook there, in terms of looking at kind of data, taking these data manifolds, the, you know, kind of these invariances in data, and trying to um, learn about their uh, structure using these manifold learning algorithms. So there's ways of thinking about how to model data as these kind of manifold structures embedded in some sort of high dimensional feature space. All right? Okay, so now the question is how do we understand what we can do with these manifolds? And now I want to step back and talk about how we can read out um, from these representations. And this is going into the theory of how, what can we read out using a linear readout from a neural network. Okay? So the basic idea is the following. right? In something like a deep neural network, you'll have these different manifold representations. Instead of thinking about you know, what's happening from a layer to layer basis, what I want to do is try to understand what representations are easily read out from the various layers of the neural network. So instead of trying to do this kind of um, uh, deep dreaming or try to reconstruct the inputs that optimizes the different representation. I want to think about what exact representations are convenient representations to read out. Okay, so the idea goes back to kind of the beginnings of mathematics of, uh, of neural networks, and it's the idea of linear separability. The question is the following, right? If I give you examples embedded in some high dimensional space, which sets of kind of uh, uh, classifications are, you in, are possible using a linear uh, classifier, 
Okay? So here's the basic mathematical problem. I give you a bunch of examples, and now I'm just, first I'll start with points, and then I'll get to manifolds. So if I give you a bunch of points in some n-dimensional, high-dimensional space, and I label these as binary labels, so some of these points are positive examples, some of these points are negative examples, the question is, how many different possibilities are you allowed to do to classify this using, say, a linear separator? And this linear separator is parameterized by some sort of weight vector that's kind of normal to the hyperplane. And so you're drawing a hyperplane, and you're trying to separate points on one side of the hyperplane from another side of the hyperplane. And when can you kind of separate this versus when you have a situation maybe where it's impossible to find a separating surface? Okay? All right, so the, the way we then understand this is we want to try to count these dichotomies. Dichotomy means, means these different types of binary labels. So if I give you p points in n-dimensional space, how many different binary labels are there of these points? Well, for every point, I can have you know, two possibilities, right? positive and negative label. And so the number of dichotomies is 2 to the p. Right? So some of these dichotomies, like this case, and say four points in two dimensions, these two points positive, these two points negative, you can separate it. This dichotomy, right, three positive, negative here, you can separate. But this, in two dimensions with four points, is impossible to separate, right, with a linear hyperplane. This is, was the famous XOR problem that Marvin Minsky talked about. Yes? Let's say uh, two to the P implies that you already know the plane equation that deals with separation. But since the plane equation can be in arbitrary orientation, aren't there, in a way, more? Isn't there more variability in this problem? So there's actually a nice result, and I'll just get to now, that. In, for points in general position, that is, as long as your kinds of points are, say, just random points in some n-dimensional space, there, you can exactly, t I can tell you that there is exactly this many that you can classify in, with a linear hyperplane, okay? And so this is, this goes back to Tom Cover now. So Cover in the 60s, Tom Cover, who's, if you read the um, information theory book, he's the author of that, he came up with a famous argument, the Cover counting theorem, that tells you that for p points in this kind of general position, think about them as random points in n dimensions, the number of different dichotomies. So out of the two to the p different labelings, there is a certain number given by this function, which is the number that you can actually successfully find a hyperplane that separates this. Okay, and so it, the the formula is this kind of sum of this combinations, and the interesting thing is there's a nice proof of this which is a recursive argument that given you know, p points in n dimensions, if I add a p plus one point, then you can count the number of possible dichotomies. So then you say the number of dichotomies that you can label is going to be you know, th the number of dichotomies of the p points plus then a one lower dimensional kind of set of dichotomies if that point happens to be on the hyperplane. So the number of dichotomies that are successfully labeled is, uh, can be separated is given by this recursion relationship then you can use induction to find that this formula is actually solves this recursion equation. All right? This is a famous theorem in, in you know, 40, 50 years old now. Okay? So this gives us the capacity of, say, how many of a perceptron? How many points, given p points in n dimensions, what's the probability that you can find a linear neural network that will basically successfully classify positive and negative examples? So what, what this formula does is I'm plotting here the number of points over the dimensionality of the system and showing kind of what the probability is of finding a linear classifier. Now the interesting thing is that if the number of points p is less than the dimensionality of the system, if p over n is equal to 1, then you can always find a linear classifier. This is something known in neural networks as the VC, Vapnishtrinov's dimension, the VC dimension of the system. So no matter what, if the number of points is less than the number, the dimensionality of the system, you can always find a linear separator. Now what happens is, as n gets larger, so as you go to higher and higher, now what happens is, in three dimensions, then the probability starts to drop according you know, to this uh, curve. But you can see what happens is that as n starts getting larger and larger, as you go to higher dimensions, an interesting phenomenon occurs, which is that the probability of being able to classify those points is 100% as long as basically the number of points is less than twice the dimensionality and drops to 0% if the number of points is greater than twice the dimensionality. This is something known in physics as a phase transition, that as, the as you go to higher dimensional systems, the number of points that you can classify successfully only depends upon this capacity, right? If the number of points that you have is less than twice the dimensionality, you can always find a linear classifier. If the number of points that you have is greater than twice the dimensionality, you can basically never find a linear classifier, okay? 
Um, it's, it's like given a high dimensional space, right? If I kind of start putting points there, you can see kind of as long as the number of points is less than the dimensionality, I can always kind of, you know, basically make a weight vector that kind of is only, you know, say has a projection on that point and is orthogonal to the other guys such that you can kind of classify that point as positive or negative. Now what happens though is high dimensional spaces is when you get to these kind of the number of points that you can get is becomes twice the dimensional. Now it's a little tricky to see and I'll t tell you how to calculate this in a second but that's, that's the effect. You know, this only happens asymptotically as the number of dimensions goes to infinity. If, if it's a finite dimensional system then you have this kind of smooth behavior. Okay. All right. So the, the problem with this analysis, Cover's analysis, it doesn't talk about robustness. Okay, so if you have noise in your system, how well can this uh, uh, can your classifier handle noise? And so the way we handle robustness noise is to talk about the margin. Okay, so when you learn about neural networks, machine learning, what you learn about is the margin of the classifier. And the way you think about this is, let's say that you can separate, you know, these points from these points, and now there's many possible hyperplanes that separate these positive examples from these negative examples. The one that you want to pick for maximum robustness is something that maximizes the margin. The margin is basically the minimum distance away from this hyperplane. And this solution is the one that will then have any kind of jitter in these points will basically still classify the, um, the, the examples properly. Okay? So then the question now is how, do I, how does the margin affect the capacity? And so what you, know, what you can then do is think about how many points can you classify with a certain prescribed margin, with a certain type of robustness. And so while we want to calculate kind of what's the capacity of a neural network with margin included. And so the way we do this is actually um, Elizabeth Gardner um, did this from a statistical mechanical point of view. And the way that I won't go through all the uh, particulars of this calculation, but the way you think about this is, right, you consider all possible kind of weight vectors. We call this the hypothesis space, right, all possible binary, uh, all possible um, linear functions like this. And then we think about in kind of the, the hyper, hypersphere of all these possible weight vectors. And every time you add a new example, it's kind of cutting down the volume of the feasible space of these hypotheses. And what you then do is you write down the volume of this feasible space in terms of this huge integral. And now you want to calculate the statistics of this integral, say, under um, a certain input distribution. We, in this case, she uses a Gaussian input distribution. So what's the kind of average, t how many points on average does it take before this hypothesis space shrinks to zero, which then tells you that you don't have a feasible solution anymore, okay? And so the way you do this in statistical mechanics is there's a nice trick, it's called the replica trick. And the way you do this is you need to do some sort of statistics, right? You need to calculate the expected value of a log of this volume. That's what we try to calculate. And the way, instead of calculating the log of the volume, you write the log in terms of the limit of the power of the volume to the n power when n goes to zero. That's a, that's a, a, a simple analytic relationship, right? And that comes about from looking at the exponential function as a limit. And then you can write down then the uh, log volume in terms of the expected, expected value of this power. That's how you do this calculation, okay? And you can write this down, you can do then the statistical mechanics and you can get a, a solution to this, okay? So then you can do this and now you get a capacity as a function of margin. So if you say that I want a system that has a certain amount of robustness, then you, I can tell you exactly how many points you can actually have, right? If you have too many points, right, you won't be able to robustly classify them. And it also tells you something about which points are interior, that is um, inside the hyperplanes, and which points are right on the kind of separating hyperplanes. That's called the support vectors, if you know anything about machine learning, versus the interior points, okay? So this is the motivation behind support vector machines, right? What support vector machines, which was kind of the technology before deep learning came about, is to take your points and you want to classify these points. Now you might not be able to separate them easily, so what you do is you lift them into a higher dimensional space where there's higher capacity, and then you find a linear separator with maximum margin in this, maximum margin in this high dimensional space. That's the kind of basic idea behind why you want to do this kernel trick and support vector machines, all right? Okay, so this is kind of just a recap of what we know theoretically about neural networks from this kind of geometrical point of view. What I want to now do is now extend this 
into classifying object manifolds, right? So now, instead of thinking about our inputs as points in a high dimensional space, I want to think about points as you know, objects with invariances. So I have you know, some sort of manifold. Think about them as, say, some generic ellipsoids, maybe. And I want to classify this set of ellipsoids from this set of ellipsoids. Okay? So this is the question. How can we do this? You can write down mathematically, again, the geometry of these manifolds. And so how do we then classify how, how well we can do this task? And so you know, as a simple example, you can think about something like a d-dimensional disk embedded in some high-dimensional space. You can write down kind of an equation for the manifolds. You can write down where the centers are. You write down kind of they have these subspaces. And then you can write down some sort of average size of these manifolds or some radius. Okay? And then you can do this formulation and you can calculate the capacity. That is, how many different manifolds can you actually successfully classify as a positive example versus a negative example with some margin? Right? So you know, I want to separate these manifolds away from each other. And you know, how, how many can I put in? And you'll see that the number of manifolds that you can do is much less than the number of points you can do because these are extended structures in high dimensional spaces. Okay? And we can do this successfully. We can write down a formula. We can calculate this. We can write down the analytical formula. We can compare it with simulations. They all perfectly match. Um, and then what you actually see is interesting. If you know anything about support vector machines, now we have a generalization of support vectors. Right? Sometimes right, when you do it with points, sometimes the points are kind of right at the margin, on the hy margin hyperplane. These are the support vectors. And sometimes they're interior. Now when you have a manifold, you might have some manifolds that are completely interior. You ha might have some manifolds that are just touching the uh, 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 margin plane. And now you might have some manifolds that are kind of fully embedded into the margin plane. Okay? This now generalizes the notion of support vectors to manifolds in terms of how the orientations in the manifolds are, are with respect to the classifier itself. Right? And then you can actually predict how, what fraction are touching, what fraction are embedded, and which fraction of manifolds are actually interior using this theory. And then you can actually then talk about things like, how do I trade off dimensionality with size? Right? So for instance, is it better to have low dimensional manifolds that are big or have small, uh, you know, higher dimensional manifolds that are smaller? What's better? Okay? And then we can, our theory then tells us that there's some sort of dimensionality scaling and kind of this quantity at a certain regime where you take the radius times the square root of the, di of the, the uh, dimensionality is what the relevant quantity is. Okay, so these are kind of how you can analyze this. And you can even do this for, I just talked about ellipsoids here and disks. You can do this with general manifolds. Right? If I give you some arbitrary sh geometries in high dimensional space, what determines whether a neural network can kind of read out successfully positive and negative examples? You can do mixtures of these manifolds. And the interesting thing is this requires now you to think about high dimensional geometry in a very non-standard way. So the problem is this, is that even um, convex objects in high dimensional spaces have a very funky geometry to them. Right? They're very different from our three dimensional intuition. When you have some convex object in, say, a hundred dimensional space, there's kind of the statistics of these objects are much different than us trying to visualize two or three dimensions. Right? So for instance, what we find in this analysis is there's a statistical property of geometry, something called the mean width which is very relevant for how well, uh, 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 how well you can separate these manifolds in these high dimensions. An example of this is you can kind of think about these high dimensional shapes as kind of you know, having some sort of small core with these kinds of projections, even though it's convex. And then you can write down some statistical um, width of this by basically analyzing kind of the extent in random directions. And then this gives you some sort of effective dimensionality of this object, even though it's kind of maybe high dimensional, it could act like a low dimensional object depending upon its mean width. Okay? So let me just give you some intuition. Okay? So if I give you something like an L1 ball, okay, what this is, is if I give you the sphere with an L1 uh, metric equal to 1, then these are kind of, if you think about this, a three dimensional L1 ball is something like an octahedron, and you generalize the high dimensional spaces. Now this L1 ball, this, this object, if you do something like try to do principal components analysis, or you do, you know, look at the covariance matrix, it looks basically just like a sphere. It's kind of an identity matrix for the covariance matrix. It looks, there's nothing about this object that tells you it's different from a sphere in kind of first and second order statistics. But when you look, 
So if you try to do SVD or you know PCA on this, you won't see anything different. But if you then look at the mean width of this object, it looks like the square root of the log of the embedding space. And so it's much different than a sphere. And so these objects act very much differently than a Euclidean sphere in terms of classification. Right? And so that's what, that, that's what our theory does. It shows you kind of how to think about these general objects with neural networks. And so, for example, this is an example of classifying a bunch of, say, two-dimensional L1 objects. So instead of points now, I can think about these as some sort of two-dimensional diamonds. And I want to classify you know, these positive examples from the negative examples with a linear classifier, and then try to figure out exactly then you know, how well I can do this. How many of these can you do? This theory tells you exactly this effect. All right? So let me uh, try to finish up here. This is, uh, has a relationship to compressed sensing for people in signal processing. The same type of high dimensional analysis can work for compressed sensing with multiple kinds of subspaces. And so what we can then do is do this kind of analysis of deep networks where you can say which layer, what the manifolds look like at each layer, and which ones are the ones you can read out, and which ones are the ones you cannot read out with, say, a final a linear layer. Okay? And then you can talk about generalization, right? Which ones are more robust to sampling noise? Which ones are more robust to um, you know, uh, 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 possible measurement noise? And you can then say exactly how many examples you need to train on to get good generalization performance. That's why I say ImageNet. Why did you need a million images before these ne deep neural networks worked? Why couldn't you have gotten away with 10,000 images? Or do you need to go to 10 million images next time? Right? These are all the kinds of questions you can start to address. So let me conclude here. I know I'm running out of time. That we talked about kind of different types of uh, representations in perception, planning, and control. I wanted to show you just a very simple theory of how neural network capacity depends upon the intrinsic geometry. And I think this is an exciting area in terms of trying to approach more of a scientific understanding of how invariances are kind of coupled with um, these types of representations in these systems. And hopefully this will lead to kind of more systematic progress in terms of how we can do better training, how we can think about better validation, and where we can put guarantees on performance. And I think that's a critical issue, is when we can guarantee the performance of some of these systems, regardless of kind of some, say, just saying that I did 99% of my training set, so trust me, it's going to work well in the future. So this is all, I think, um, important issues. I just want to acknowledge all the students at Penn, at the Grass Lab that Rujina founded and in terms of uh, these types of work. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, so the theory right here is talking about kind of perceptual representations. So it's more on the kind of input side of things. What we would like to, you know, the full system will take some input representation and couple it with this kind of what we said, the planning action space. And so then the, then the question is how do you kind of go from perceptual states to kind of state representations that you can use for decision making and planning. So that's still work to be done. But yeah, so the theory right now is more on the perception side, trying to understand what deep neural networks do. And then we want to eventually close the loop, like Rujina would always say, close the loop with action so that you can do something better there. Exactly. So we're assuming here that you did some 
whatever transform into a Euclidean space. So the, the distance function that we're using for the margin is the Euclidean distance. And that's kind of the standard assumption in all these kind of kernel methods and things like that, is that if it's not, let's say that it's a Malinobis distance or something that you want to use, then you can just do a linear transform of all your data and then make it a problem in the Euclidean space. So that's possible. Now, if it's nonlinear, they have to do some other type of kind of a transformation. But we're assuming that there has been some transformation of data where we're not we're reasoning about a Euclidean distance. Sure, but uh, the question is how do you actually find uh, what manifolds you're using? And if you're just saying manifolds of different instances of the same thing, probably isometric, you know, what, what uh, so it seems like metric is what you're preserving, right? But how do you make sure, how, yeah. how do you know and how do you find that yeah, so, so th that's, I, I, uh, that's, there's a whole set of what we call manifold learning algorithms where you give me some generic data and you're going to discover the geometry of the actual manifolds by analyzing things like, you know, these, basically you do some sort of local nearest neighbor analysis and you put, embed them in graphs and then you find some vector representation that, you know, kind of uh, has, you know, basically reformats these manifolds. So that's, that's a completely different algorithm is in terms of how you kind of find the manifold representations in this vector space, okay? Or in our case, we're saying that you have a deep neural network. It does something. It gives you some of these vectors in this intermediate layer. And I'm saying that the invariances are captured by some sort of manifold representation. It's in this space. So it's given to you with a deep neural network. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's getting a little specialized for me, so I wanted to ask a more general question. Um, the, since you spent the second half of your talk talking about uh, using neural networks, I get the impression that uh, all those uh, robots crashed because they were using neural networks. <laughs> yeah. Now, are they really using neural networks, or is that just a general way of thinking about optimization? Good point, yes. Um, most robots right now don't use just a neural network, right? There's a lot of human engineering inside these robots to make them work, okay? Now, the vision is that of all these companies and people is that somehow you can magically put a neural network in and replace all this kind of models and human engineering. Now, what I'm saying is that we don't understand the limitations of these neural networks, so we need to understand that first before we try to just blindly throw it into these systems. And that's the point I wanted to make. Yeah, so the problem is you have something you don't understand, which is robotic, and now you want to combine it with something else <laughs> you don't understand, which is neural network. <laughs> and is that the best strategy? Uh, that's what Google's betting on, right? This is what some of these companies are betting on. I don't think it's a great strategy, but uh, you're right. It's, we want to make this kind of a more principled way of understanding both domains, right, on, on the robotics and the neural network. Thank you.